Excellencies, distinguished guests, good morning. Uh, and, and thank you for joining day two um, of this fantastic conference. I'm going to open day two by looking at case studies on the use of artificial intelligence by courts and judges and also by legal professionals. Now, we heard yesterday from Mr. Mutawi um, an introduction to how AI and technology is being used by judges. So today, I want to expand uh, on that and look at some real-life scenarios in which AI is being used today uh, and also think about how it could be used in the future. So I will start off by giving an overview of the use of technology in the legal industry. Um, and as we will see, not all of the technology that is being used is artificial intelligence. But AI does have an important role to play in the legal industry. And it is also being used today in the legal industry. And I will go on to see some examples of how it is being used in courts around the world and also by legal professionals. And I will look in detail at one specific use of AI, which is in relation to document review and analysis, where machine learning tools are incredibly powerful. They are being used today very accurately. And we will end the session by looking at where the future will go in terms of the use of AI. So to start with, I would like to explore how technology is being used in the legal industry. My feeling, which you may agree, is that sometimes the legal industry can be slow to adopt new technologies. This may be because, as an industry, we are quite conservative. Sometimes we fear new technologies and the risks that these create. But on the other hand, we always have to remember our public functions as judicial functions of the state and as legal professionals. We have a very important role to play in society, and so it's important that before we adopt new technology, we are happy that that new technology is accurate, reliable, and that it ultimately improves the judicial function. But with that risk awareness, we do have to remember that new technology can improve the legal industry. For those of you who are aware of the judicial system in India, if you have a property case in India, you may be waiting decades before you can get a judgment and a resolution to that case. Technology can improve access to justice to ensure that people do obtain legal redress from the courts. Technology can also help provide efficient solutions, which itself can generate competition in the legal industry. And competition is good because it means that law firms in particular are more competitive when it comes to price. And as is the case across the world, I think there is a, a fair criticism that sometimes legal services are too expensive and therefore not available to everyone in society. And finally, there's a question about whether or not technology can improve the quality of justice. And for me, that is one of the biggest issues, and I think there is still a big question mark about whether technology, and specifically artificial intelligence, genuinely does improve the quality of justice. And as I say, I think we all need to be reassured that the quality of justice does improve before we adopt too readily artificial intelligence and other technology in the legal industry. But as we will come on to see, technology is being used today. Artificial intelligence is being used today in the legal industry. And I think that is a trend. And in 10 or 20 years time, it is inevitable that we will see more and more technology in the legal industry. Now, I'm going to talk today about the use of technology in both the courts, the judicial system, and also by legal professionals in perhaps the more private legal industry. Now, of course, those two structures are quite different. They have different funding arrangements. They have different stakeholders. Courts are certainly more accountable to the public. 
Law firms, for example, are perhaps more accountable to their clients. So there are differences between how technology is and should be used as between judicial functions and private law functions. But those two institutions can and should work together when it comes to technology. And the interrelationships and the collaboration that we can use between courts on the one hand and law firms and legal professionals on the other hand can be a good way of embracing new technology. And courts can help legal professionals and legal professionals can help courts. I'll give you an example of this. In the English courts at the moment, we have a system that the courts have adopted, which is to encourage legal professionals to file documents electronically, to reduce the number of hard copy documents we have. That was an initiative launched by the courts and the legal professionals are then having to comply with that new initiative. Equally, legal professionals are introducing new technology which the courts are having to grapple with and understand. So we'll come on to see later, legal professionals are finding new innovative ways of reviewing evidence. And the courts, perhaps at the start, were somewhat reluctant to accept those new innovative methods but they too will slowly be encouraged that this is a way of using technology in the legal industry. So I firmly believe that courts and legal professionals can work together collaboratively to test new technology, to adopt new technology, and to improve new technology. Now I set out on the slide here what I think is a summary of how technology is currently used both by courts and judges, and by legal professionals. Obviously, this will vary between jurisdictions. Some jurisdictions have been quicker to adopt technology in their judicial systems. Other jurisdictions are a little bit slower. But these are some of the uses that we're seeing. So for example, in courts, we are seeing the use of electronic filing of documents. There are no longer the days where you have to go to court with your hard copy document and physically give it to a person. Now you have the ability to email a document or use an electronic filing system. Secondly, we're also seeing a reduction in the number of hard copy documents that are used in court proceedings. 20 years ago in the English courts, you would see hundreds of files of documents behind a judge which would be used in the court proceedings. Now we're starting to see a move towards using documents electronically so that judges are using computers in front of them to see the evidence um, and their judgments are issued on a computer rather than by hand. We're also seeing the use of online records, which I know is something that the Dubai courts have adopted. So you can check the status of your case, you can obtain your judgment online. And in some cases, we're seeing the use of virtual courts where people don't even need to be in the courtroom. So if you have a witness who is located overseas, you do not need them to come to your jurisdiction to provide evidence. They can provide evidence by video link. And with lawyers, we're seeing the use of technology as well. Remote working, it might sound obvious, but we are seeing more and more lawyers work away from the office, either on a plane or in their homes using technology. Case management. Lawyers are also removing the use of hard copy files and moving to electronic systems of working. Legal research. Again, 20 years ago, there would be big law libraries where in order to do legal research, we would have to visit them, look at hard copy textbooks. Nowadays, everything is online. Most legal research can be conducted online. Textbooks are available court records and cases are available. E-discovery. For me, this is one of the biggest uses of AI in the legal industry, and I will spend some time later on talking about e-discovery. E-discovery is the process of reviewing and analyzing documentary evidence, which is one of the most important processes in court proceedings, um, but also in non-contentious matters, for example, in reviewing contracts, and I will come on to show you how AI is being used in that area in particularly. 
So that was more technology generally. Now I want to look at how artificial intelligence is being used in the legal industry. Now some of you will have heard the terms law tech or legal tech to describe the use of technology in the legal industry. And a lot of law tech is marketed as being based on artificial intelligence. But I do want to sound a note of caution at this point. A lot of legal technology, even some of it which says it is AI, is not actually artificial intelligence. We looked yesterday at the unique features of, of artificial intelligence, the fact that the AI system acts autonomously and makes its own independent decisions. The reality is that a lot of technology in the legal industry is not yet artificial intelligence. It is more similar to traditional computer programming where you have pre-programmed rules and a human has set those rules. Indeed, in the UK, our law society recently did a, a research study about the use of technology in the legal industry. And they said, in the UK, current forms of law tech are still more focused on efficiencies and automation than on delivering new types of law. So what they were saying is, AI is being used, but perhaps not as much as people think. And the reason we hear AI a lot is because law firms have an interest in saying they use AI. Legal professionals like to say they use AI. There is AI being used, but you just have to be cautious um, when you hear the term AI, because not all technology is AI. Now, we spoke yesterday about the reasons why AI is becoming more prevalent today in the world. There are two reasons, fundamentally, I think. The first is the availability of big data. This means data in electronic digital form. The second is computer processing power. Today, we have more powerful computers than ever before. Just to give you an example of how powerful computers are, Intel's latest chip can review and process 8,000 images every second. That is a level of processing power we have not had in years. And when you combine those two factors, we can understand why AI is becoming so prevalent today. And the ability of AI to process all this data using its vast processing power gives rise to legal issues. And when you think about it, it is obvious why AI is going to give rise to legal issues and why it is going to have an impact on the legal industry. For example, legal issues arise from the fact that so much data is being processed. We now have many concerns about data privacy uh, and infringement of people's rights. That wasn't an issue decades ago when we didn't have all this data to use. We now have new types of disputes which have arisen because of the huge amounts of data which are being reviewed. Cybercrime is, is a new dispute that we didn't have a few years ago, and it has arisen because of the availability of big data. Equally, we have new ways of detecting crime through the use of big data. I spoke yesterday about banks having systems whereby they can identify fraudulent transactions used on your account. They can do that because of the availability of big data. And as I will come on to discuss, we have new ways of reviewing evidence. The machines are getting very good at identifying what is relevant evidence and what is not very relevant evidence. So I do think that AI has a big role to play in the legal industry, and I think it's only a matter of time before we see AI being used in a big way. We hear the term big data. We spoke about big data yesterday. I am talking about it now. What does big data actually mean? I just want to give you an insight into how much data we are actually talking about, because sometimes it is very difficult to conceptualize the amount of data we are talking about. Here are some words that I'm sure some of you might never have seen before. 
because they are relatively new words and they are used to describe the amount of data. 10 years ago, we would have spoken in terms of megabytes and gigabytes. We wouldn't really have spoken about terabytes when talking about data. Terabytes are now everyday usage. We are talking about terabytes of data in legal cases. We are talking about terabytes of data in other contexts. A zettabyte is the current size of our en entire data universe. And to put that into context, each time we go down a step, we multiply the amount of data a thousand times. But you're probably still wondering what that means in reality. So I've tried to come up with a system to help you understand how much data we are talking about. Imagine you have a box, not very big, a box that some of you probably use in your day-to-day -day jobs. One of these boxes can hold 2,000 pages of paper. Most of you, or some of you, will have an iPhone. The iPhone can hold 128 gigabytes of data. If you printed out all that data in hard copy, you would fill 12,800 of those boxes. And if you lined up those boxes next to each other in one straight line, the boxes would go for five kilometers. That's just one iPhone. If we jump ahead to Google Mail, Gmail, which some of you may use, the entirety of Google Mail is 230 petabytes. To put that into context, you would need 21 billion boxes if you printed out the entirety of Google Mail. And if you lined up those boxes next to each other, they would run for 8 million kilometers. And just so you understand what 8 million kilometers looks like, it's the length of the line at the bottom of the screen, and that's the distance between the Earth and the Moon. That's the entirety of Google Mail. And I have two charts to show you how much data we process on a daily basis. This chart shows in 2018 how much data was processed every minute, 60 seconds. In every minute in 2018, there were 473,000 tweets. In one minute, 97,000 hours of Netflix were watched. And in one minute in 2018, there were 3.9 million Google searches. Again, some more figures for you to see. In one minute in 2018, 160 million emails were sent. And in one minute in 2018, 63 websites were hacked, just in one minute. If you imagine how much data we are creating, it's absolutely no surprise that we're going to have issues surrounding that data, but it's also no surprise that that data is going to give us many advantages and abilities to improve processes and functions, particularly in the legal industry. And so now I want to look at how artificial intelligence is being used around the world by courts and judges. And when you think about all of that data, the one that really sticks out for me is 160 million emails every minute in the world. And the reason I find that staggering is because that is new data that is being processed. That is data that didn't exist before. So every email that is being created is data in itself. And so it's inevitable that AI is going to be used to help various processes, particularly in the legal industry. Now, I want to start off by reminding ourselves about the importance of the role of courts and judges. Courts and judges make decisions every day on legal liability. Those decisions have profound social, moral, and economic implications for society. For individuals, the decisions that judges make have profound implications on their liberty. The difference between being in prison and not being in prison is obviously significant. And judges are responsible 
and they assist in interpreting and setting moral standards in society. And so it is absolutely vital that decision-making in judicial functions has integrity, has justification, and has respect for fundamental rights. And that's why we need to be careful before adopting artificial intelligence and technology too readily. We have to be sure that the use of that technology does not hinder judicial functions, which are so important in society. I want to look at four areas in which AI can be used in the judiciary. AI could be used to replace judges. Now, personally, and it's something that we've been discussing um, during the conference, I think that's quite a controversial proposition. How can we really replace the intelligence and the experience of human judges? I don't think that's something that's going to happen for a few years, but never say never, as they say. More currently, what we're seeing is artificial intelligence used to assist judges, perhaps in sentencing or issuing judgments. Or AI is being used to assist in various different court processes. I will also look at the use of AI in semi-judicial functions, so how AI is being used by law enforcement and police around the world. So let's look firstly at the possibility of AI replacing judges. So that is the point about AI being used to take decisions which would otherwise be taken by judges. Now, today, there aren't many examples of this, which perhaps is unsurprising. And I think the prospect of AI replacing judges is only suitable for straightforward cases, perhaps only civil cases. And I think it's probably perhaps suitable only where there is a small amount of evidence and scenarios in which there can't be many parameters that as judges you have to deal with. And one thing that strikes me is that it's very important to have a human element in judicial decision making. Let's say you're faced with a simple case of theft and the person alleged to have stolen a particular product is homeless. And let's say they have stolen some food in order that they can remain alive. Now, are we really saying that we can trust an AI system to understand the human aspects of that case? Now, I'm not saying that that person should not be found guilty of theft. You might agree or disagree with that. But isn't the point that we would like a human to understand the sympathies involved in that case and provide a more human-orientated approach to the decision-making in that case. And for me, I really wonder whether we're, at this stage, ready to allow a machine learning artificial intelligence system to make those sorts of decisions. I'm not sure. Even where we allow AI to replace judges, it is crucial that we have some level of human oversight, particularly when we are first introducing new technology. We need to test the system. We need to monitor it. We need to consult with people about how it's being used. That is going to be a vital process generally when it comes to artificial intelligence in the legal industry. The first case study is where AI is being used in a very limited context in replacing judges, and that's in Estonia. And I'm sure many of you know that Estonia is taking leaps forward when it comes to artificial intelligence in the judiciary. They have a chief data officer in their government who has a very ambitious program to introduce AI into public functions. And they are currently testing a system whereby artificial intelligence will approve and generate the paperwork required for execution cases. So where a judge has already decided that there is liability, the judge then hands the case over to the AI system to approve or not approve the execution of that judgment and to generate the paperwork from it. Now, we don't know much about how the system is being used because there isn't much 
information available in the public domain, but we do know that it's being used for very simple cases, like parking tickets or for child benefit cases. And we understand that in 2019, there were 16 cases that were used using the new AI system in Estonia. The, one of the reasons they introduced this system was because it's quite a straightforward process, but there are thousands of these cases every year. So it makes sense in that context where you don't need much human oversight, where the decisions are relatively straightforward to try and use AI technology for this sort of process. Now, I have said at the bottom of this screen, it's not quite clear whether this is genuine artificial intelligence. Is it a system operating independently and autonomously, or has it been pre-programmed with all the rules it needs to make decisions in these cases? We're not quite sure at this stage because there is not that much information available, but perhaps it makes more sense that it is automation rather than AI. Now, we're also seeing AI being used to assist judges with different parts of their job. So not taking over the whole judicial function and replacing judges, but just helping different parts of the process. So that could be analyzing the facts or evidence in a particular case, allowing the judge to see how previous similar cases have been decided, or even writing parts of the judgment for example, in sentencing. Now, it's perhaps more justifiable to let artificial intelligence help with the process rather than replace the process. But even here, we need to exercise some caution because even taking over one part of a judge's role could affect the overall decision. And as we've seen, the implications of judicial decision-making can be profound. So we need to be careful, even where AI is being used in just one part of the judicial decision-making process. And I say that partly because of this interesting example that we saw in the US in 2016. Now, the defendant here, Mr. Loomis, was found guilty of being, in a, being involved in a drive-by shooting. Now, the prosecution in Wisconsin started to use an AI tool called Compass. And what that tool did was to assess the likelihood of defendants reoffending, committing the same crime again. And in this particular case, the AI tool showed that the defendant had a high risk of reoffending. And partly on that basis, the judge gave the defendant, Mr. Loomis, a particularly long sentence in prison. Now, the defendant was not permitted to challenge the report in the first court. So he appealed to the Wisconsin Supreme Court saying, why have I been given a sentence based on an AI tool that I wasn't allowed to challenge and of which there may be some uncertainty? How do we know this AI tool is working as it should be? Now, the Supreme Court in Wisconsin rejected that appeal. They said, we understand your concerns. There may be some concerns about the AI tool, but actually in this case, we are happy that the judge would have given you the same sentence, even without the AI tool. Now that may be right, in which case, maybe the sentence was justified initially. But research came out about this AI tool, Compass, which showed that the data that was being used in the AI tool was itself inherently prejudiced against black defendants. And Mr. Loomis was a black defendant. So there were concerns about the use of this AI tool. And so we can see even where we use AI in discrete parts of a judge's role, in this case, sentencing, we have to be absolutely sure that the AI tool is accurate, that it doesn't have any bias or prejudice in it, and we have to test it and monitor it. And I'm concerned that that didn't happen in this case. Another use of AI in sentencing has been used by the 
Henan Court in China, where AI is being used to help write judgments. So the AI system being used here is very sophisticated. It relies on natural language processing, and it can be upgraded when new laws and new regulations are introduced. The technology has won 10 patents, so it is a very sophisticated piece of technology. And again, we don't have much information about how it's being used, but we understand that it assists judges by telling them how a sentence in previous cases has been applied based on similar facts and circumstances to the present case. And then the AI tool goes on to write the part of the judgment which deals with the sentencing of the particular individual. And the Chinese courts have said this has reduced the amount of time required to write the judgment by 70%. So they are clearly using this to improve the efficiency of the process. In this case, the process of writing the judgments and arriving at a sentence for the individual. Now, in other cases, we are seeing AI used to assist judges more generally. So not to replace any part of their decision making, not to replace any part of the role of judges, for example, in sentencing or judgment writing, but maybe in reviewing or analyzing evidence and also in processing what is happening in a courtroom. Now, for me, this seems to be the logical step to take. You start off by using AI in very limited roles within a courtroom or in the judicial process. And that allows us as a society, it allows you as judges to see how AI can help the process. But what it means is that you can take smaller steps in applying AI to your everyday jobs and see how it is being used and see if it is accurate or reliable before allowing AI to do too much. And we have a phrase, doing too much too soon. If you allow AI to do all of your job at the start, then there are certainly going to be issues, as we have seen. So there are two more examples I want to talk about in terms of how AI is being used to assist judges. So again, going back to China, in January of this year, the Shanghai courts introduced something called the 206 system, and it was used for the first time in a criminal trial this year. Now, the 206 system is incredibly powerful. It is a very sophisticated piece of AI technology, but it is only being used for limited purposes. It is being used to process what is happening in the courtroom. So instead of having humans who are writing out what is being said, the AI technology transcribes exactly what people are saying in the courtroom. And it is powerful enough to understand who is talking at any given time in the courtroom. It also allows witnesses to provide evidence by video link. And for me, this is a logical starting point for AI. It is not letting AI do too much too soon when it comes to judicial processes. We're seeing a similar system in Pakistan, which is about to be launched. Now, in Pakistan, there is a particular problem with criminal appeals. There are still some appeals outstanding from 1994 which have still not been dealt with. So Pakistan has attempted to introduce an artificial intelligence system, which they are going to launch later this year. And the purpose of this system is to review previous cases with similar facts and to show the judge quickly how judges in previous decisions have approached the question of how to decide the appeal and what sentences have been given in previous cases that are similar to this one. So again, you're not letting the AI decide what the sentence should be. You're not even letting the AI write the judgment that deals with the sentence as they're using in China. You're simply using AI to make the research process and the understanding process much more efficient. The decision making is still left to the judges. And for me, that's a very important point. Now, we're also seeing AI used in law enforcement. And again, there are differences between jurisdictions. But we tend to see AI being used in surveillance. 
which can be quite a controversial area, particularly when facial recognition is used. We're seeing it in predictive policing, working out where crimes are likely to happen and what type of crimes are likely to happen. In Singapore, they are using a robotic police force. These are AI-powered robots that patrol the streets in Singapore. They use AI-powered navigation and mapping systems. They can hear what is happening on the streets, and they can report back to a central police function to say there is something going on in this part of the town or in this part of the town. It was a very interesting report published jointly by Unicree and Interpol um, last year about the use of robotics in law enforcement. And there's a very useful analysis there on the slide about how robotics is being used. The report was interesting because it emphasized that even though AI can be used in law enforcement, it is absolutely vital to remember that the use of AI must be fair, it must be accountable, it must be transparent, and it must be explainable. If you are using AI in law enforcement, you must be able to explain how it is being used and why its use respects citizens' fundamental rights. And this comes back to the main point I'm discussing. If we are to use AI in judicial systems, we have to be sure that the AI is reliable, it's accurate, it respects people's rights, because what we do in judicial functions is so important to individuals' liberty and to economic moral standards generally in society. I want to move on now to talk about how AI is being used by legal professionals. In 2019, in Europe alone, there were 248 startup companies involved in legal technology. Now, as I said previously, many of these companies don't actually use artificial intelligence, but some of these do. And the biggest area is in documents and contracts. So reviewing contracts and reviewing evidence. But there are various other areas in which technology and AI is being used. Legal research, in regulatory compliance, and in litigation. And I want to come on to see some of those examples and show you how it's being used. The biggest use, by far, is in document review and document analysis. And this is where AI is being used on an everyday basis by law firms, and it's where AI is being used accurately and reliably. This map shows over the last two years, the percentage of people who have experienced a legal issue. It's perhaps unsurprising to see that across most of the world, someone has experienced a legal issue. In those legal issues, there will inevitably be documents involved, whether that be contracts or evidence, particularly in contentious matters, so litigation and arbitration. And one of the most crucial aspects of litigation or arbitration is finding the relevant evidence. And if we just think back to how much big data is available now, every minute 160 million emails are being created. There is so much evidence out there. And as legal professionals, as judges, we need to find the right evidence. Now, I'm going to give you an example of uh, an interesting report that was issued in the UK back in 2009, and it was called the Jackson Report after the, the judge who um, produced it. And one of the purposes of the report was to show how expensive litigation can be. And one of the reasons it is so expensive is because of the volume of documentation, the amount of evidence that is being produced in legal cases. Now, in the report, a medium-sized case was looked at. So not even a big case, not a small case, a medium case in the context of litigation. In this particular case, there were 500 gigabytes of data. That translated to 7.5 million documents. That's a medium-sized case. 
and they looked at the costs of reviewing that evidence. What that means is, if you have one lawyer, one human being, reviewing all of that evidence to find the relevant evidence, to exclude the irrelevant evidence, how long would that take and how much would it cost? Let's assume the lawyer is reviewing 30 documents every hour. I think that's about right. And let's say the lawyer is charging 1,100 dirhams per hour. You may think that's expensive. I think that's probably about average for a law firm dealing with a medium-sized case. If you have one lawyer reviewing 7.5 million documents using those assumptions, it will take that lawyer 28 and a half years to review all of the evidence, and it will cost the client 280 million dirhams. That can't be the case. We, we, we can't allow that to happen. Clients are not going to pay bills that much. But what is the answer? Because the evidence to decide the case is in those seven and a half million documents. Now, there are techniques available to reduce the amount of evidence that we're dealing with. We can remove duplicate data from the data set. So in the 7.5 million documents we have, there is software that allows you to remove any repeat documents. You can also apply date ranges to the documents. So let's say you only want to find evidence from 2014 to 2016. You can use software to remove evidence from outside of that date range. You can also apply search terms, keywords. You can tell the computer system, I want to find documents relating to this particular project. Now, just a word on keywords. I don't know if any of you use the Google autocomplete function, but even when you try to use keywords and search for particular evidence, it is not always reliable. When you type the word diamond into Google, you get many different types of situation in which the word diamond is used. So even when you try to search for evidence using particular words, it is not that reliable. But let's say you manage to reduce the seven and a half million documents to half a million documents. So you have reduced it by a considerable amount. It would still take one lawyer 695 days to review all of that evidence, and it would still cost 19 million dirhams to review the 500,000 documents. Reviewing evidence, finding the relevant evidence, is not an easy task, particularly in this day and age when we have so much data. So what's the answer? Well, artificial intelligence. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this technology exists today. I use it on all of my cases. And it's technology based on machine learning that allows you to find the relevant evidence very quickly. Now, for those who were here yesterday, we talked about how machine learning operates. And this is a typical machine learning system. You ask the computer to review all of the data, which it can do very quickly. Remember, Intel's processing chip can process 8,000 images every second. So 7.5 million documents, no problem for the AI system. It can review all of those documents. And it can find patterns in those documents. And in finding those patterns, it can find the relevant evidence and the not relevant evidence. And if you use the supervised machine learning system, you can help the AI system. You can show it different examples of relevant evidence. You can say, here is a re very relevant contract, and here is a very relevant email. And when you tell the machine learning system what the relevant evidence is, and you only need a few examples, the system learns. It learns from those examples, and that process of categorizing relevant evidence and not relevant evidence becomes very accurate. And the technology that we use at the moment is called continuous active learning. It is a machine learning system. And that technology is being used today by many law firms across the world. Now, the English courts were slightly reluctant to allow parties to use this technology. They said, how do you know this technology is accurate? 
you are exchanging evidence in the case which has been extracted from the machine. But how do you know that is the right evidence? It took the English courts until 2016 before they accepted that this technology was good. And now, the English courts expect parties to use this technology. If you come to the English courts and say, we have two million documents, and we want to review those two million documents manually, the court will say, how much is that going to cost? And you will have to say, millions of pounds. And the court will say, well, don't do that. The technology is available there to find the relevant evidence and to reduce the costs. Now, in 2016, the technology involved finding a set of relevant documents. So the lawyers would find maybe 100 documents, which they said were very relevant. And you would feed the 100 documents to the AI system. And the AI system would review the 100 documents, and then it would look at the entire document set, so the three million documents you have, and it would categorize those documents based on relevance. And that process takes hours, not days, weeks, months, hours. In 2019, the technology has developed. Now, the machine itself will find the relevant documents. We still help the machine because we look at certain documents and we say, you got this one right, this is relevant. Or we look at one document and say, this is not quite right. You have said it's 75% relevant, I would say it's 50% relevant. And every time the human gives the machine some information about how relevant a document is, the machine recategorizes all of the documents. And these numbers are taken from a case I did recently. A client gave me 78,000 documents and said, find me the relevant evidence. Now, I could have reviewed all of the relevant evidence manually. I could have sat in a room turning the page. That would have taken months. Instead, we used the predictive coding machine learning system. Within a few hours, the system told me there were 5,600 relevant documents. Now, of course, I looked at a few of those documents. I gave the system some training. I said, you've got this right, this document, that is certainly relevant. This one is perhaps not so relevant. And each time I told the machine a few examples and trained it, it became more accurate. And we trained it over the course of a few days. But after a few days, we thought it was accurate. Every time we took an example document, we agreed with the machine's analysis of the relevance of that document. So in a matter of days, in 78,000 documents, we were able to find the most relevant documents. If you were doing that process manually, it would have taken months. Now, this technology is continuing to be improved. It can now use natural language processing which means machines are able to understand the language that humans use. So now, the technology can identify countries, people, places. And so if you're looking for a specific project amongst lots of documents, the system can help you. The system can identify sentiments or emotion in emails. So let's say, for example, you are involved in a dispute and you are telling the other side, you haven't paid my bills. And the other party says, you haven't delivered my product. You haven't constructed the building. Those emails may be slightly more angry or less friendly. The system can now understand the emotions being used in emails. And it can identify where those emails are. So it can quickly take you to the emails where there are arguments being had between the parties. For those of you who use emojis in your text messages or WhatsApp messages, the system can now analyze emojis as well. So it will understand if you are sending a happy message to someone or maybe an unhappy message to your boss. I can also ask the system to analyze the communications of one person. And the system can tell me this is what this person talks about in emails during the daytime, and this is what this person talks about 
during the evening. So let's say, for example, that two people are working in a financial institution. During the day, they send each other normal emails relating to their business. But in the evening, they send each other text messages because they are plotting a crime that they are going to commit. And they are talking about a way that they can plan a fraud. They don't do it over email, they only do it over text messaging, and they only do it in the evening. In a matter of minutes, the system can show me those text messages. It can find them and tell me there is something odd going on with this person's communications. It is sending emails during the day, which seem normal. It is sending text messages during the evening, which don't seem normal. Now, how long would it take you to find those text messages manually? You would need to review all of the evidence. In a matter of hours or even minutes, the machine can find those for you. Image recognition is quite a big area now in artificial intelligence. You will have heard of the use of facial recognition, and obviously that carries with it some risks and some controversies. But in the context of reviewing evidence, image recognition can be very, very helpful. This is an image of my actual office in London, and we used the system to identify people, which it was able to do, and it was also able to identify that there was a building. So let's say you have a big construction case, which is quite typical in Dubai. And let's say there is a dispute between the architect, the designer of the building, and the contractor who built the building. And let's say the contractor says, well, I built the building, but you gave me the wrong design, so that's why something has gone wrong. And the architect says, I never gave you the wrong design. Every design I gave you was accurate. Now, in order to determine that dispute, we will need to look at all of the designs available in the documents that the architect and the contractor have. If the project took 10 years to build, there will be thousands, hundreds of thousands of designs and drawings. The system can identify those drawings and it can compare the drawings. And it can do that in a matter of minutes using image recognition. So you can see that the use of technology in reviewing evidence is here, we are using it, it is powerful, and it is accurate. And for me, that's one of the, the best uses and, and the best examples of how artificial intelligence is being used in the legal industry today. And I am certain that technology like this will be used across courts throughout the world by legal professionals across the world in a matter of years. So very briefly, I just want to show you how AI is also being used by legal professionals in other contexts. The first one is in the use of reviewing contracts. So a similar sort of concept, AI being used to review text. Now, there is one particular tool I just want to talk about, which is a, a company called Seal, and it has a contract discovery tool. And in 48 hours, that tool was able to review 200,000 documents. It was able to identify contracts in that set of documents. And it was even able to identify specific clauses. And it was able to say to the human, there are some confidential contracts within the 200,000, so you should be careful about those contracts. That can be an incredibly powerful use of AI. I spoke about intellectual property yesterday. If you have developed a new piece of technology and you want to file a patent for that technology, then it will be helpful for you to know if any other patent already exists around the world. How do you find that information out? You could visit every patent office in the world or access their website and review all of their patents to understand if someone else has registered a patent for your technology. Or you could use a piece of artificial intelligence. And this piece of software analyzes all patent applications around the world, and in a matter of minutes, tells you someone has filed a patent for your technology in this country, so you shouldn't file a patent there. Or it will say, no patent has been filed in these countries. So you're able to know very quickly where you should file your patent. And in legal research, AI is being used to help lawyers and judges conduct legal research. There was an experiment done in the US 
using an AI system to conduct legal research, and they trained it against humans conducting the legal research manually. And they found that the AI platform was 24% quicker than the humans undertaking the research manually. And 75% of the lawyers said they preferred using the AI platform to conduct the research. Now, just very quickly, there is a, a piece of technology called Ross Intelligence. Um, and the reason I like this piece of software is because if you go on its website, they tell you exactly how their artificial intelligence system works. And the way it works is you type in a question. So let's say you ask, what are the rules of decennial liability under UAE law? The system will analyze the language that you use in your question. And it's very powerful because it will understand that the word decennial should go next to the word liability. It won't search for liability on its own because that will bring back many, many results. It understands because it has reviewed many cases and many textbooks and it, it has reviewed questions and answers from lawyers. It knows that the words decennial and liability go together. And so you can ask this piece of software a question and apparently it will give you accurate results. I should say, I'm not sure it's working on UAE law yet. I think it's mainly working on New York law. So that's how AI is being used currently, by judges, by legal professionals. Where do I think we go from here? I think there's certainly going to be a trend towards AI being used in judicial functions. Potentially, one day, we will have AI replacing judges in decision-making, but I think that is still many years away. For the moment, I think we will have AI being used to help judges in their day-to-day -day functions, whether that be reviewing evidence or helping with parts of the judgment or even directing the judge to previous cases which have been decided by other judges to help them in deciding what should be the right decision to make. I think we will see technology being used by legal professionals throughout the world. The technology I've been talking about today to review evidence, I'm certain, will be here for many years to come and will make more efficient the process of reviewing documents. Now, there's obviously a word of caution to be said here. We have to make sure that the quality of legal advice, that the quality of justice is not detrimentally affected by the use of AI. The Monetary Authority of Singapore have already taken steps because they see lawyers providing advice based on AI. And so they have introduced a set of principles to guide how lawyers should be advising if they are relying on AI. And the purpose of that is to ensure that the quality of the legal advice is not affected. We need to be careful that we don't allow the biggest law firms to use the best technology and to price out smaller competitors. There is a risk in using greater technology that we create monopolies in the legal industry. We have to be careful that we ensure that there is always competition. And as lawyers and judges, I think one of the biggest responsibilities we have is that we keep up to date with techn technological developments. Because only then can we understand what technology is available, how it can be used, and most importantly, how good it is. But I think it's fair to say technology and artificial intelligence is here, it is being used, and it will be used in the future. I just think we have to be very careful about how it is introduced and that we ensure that we keep monitoring it, assessing it, and making sure that the quality of justice is not impaired. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if there, there are any. Yeah. Good morning. 
Uh, Mr. Tana, thank you very much for again a brilliant presentation. Uh, my name is Philip van Lintout. I'm an investigating judge in, in Belgium and I'm specialized in terrorism cases. And I had two questions for you uh, to see how you think about that. Um, one of the problems in criminal law with artificial intelligence to my ID is the fact that in order to have a good judgment, you need all evidence collected. And my fear is that uh, a computer system works with something that has been inputted into the system. How can we be sure that um, the system will have all the information needed? Because would we have checks and balances to even know that, for example, police has collected all the evidence available? You have a crime scene, you have witnesses that we hear, you have uh, digital traces, fingerprints, DNA. If it is not put into the system, the system will make a judgment upon not correct information or not the totality of information, and you will have at the end a judgment that would be this is the outcome of the case. So that's something where I'm afraid about, and I would like to have your idea about it. Second question is uh, I'm a terrorism judge, and we highly depend upon uh, all the information also a lot of information that is collected and that is assessed. I think artificial intelligence would be able to help us with that. But yesterday we talked about responsibility and liability. What if the artificial intelligence tool gives me, for example, the answer that a person is not dangerous and the system would have missed something in the whole of the information and that person would do an attack or a suicide attack, who is responsible? That's something that also pre preoccupies me because there you will have, yeah, is it, is it still the police? Is it the judiciary? Is it the artificial intelligence? How would we cope with that? Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think taking your first question um, about how the AI system collects the data, how can we be sure that 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 data is reliable. Um, I think when we talk about AI today, one of the words that we emphasize is trust. And I think Mr. Turner will come on to talk about building trust in AI systems. And I think that's a very important concept. When we are building AI technology, it is not a case of developing the technology and implementing it straight away. We have to have a long period of testing the AI technology and that means looking at the data that it is collecting, and throughout that testing period, always have human oversight. So have humans look at the data that's being collected, have humans test the data, have humans look at the output of the AI system to see whether the decisions that it is making are consistent with how a human would make the, 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 the decision. So there is always going to be, and there should be, a strong assessment period and assessment process to make sure that the technology is as accurate as it could be. But I would say this, and, and I think it comes on to your second question. If we have built an AI system and we've undergone significant testing and we are happy that it is working in a reliable way, in an accurate way, then I think at some point we have to accept that it might make a mistake now and then. It might identify someone who is dangerous or not dangerous and be mistaken in that assessment. Because we also have to say, humans are not perfect. We as humans make mistakes, so we shouldn't necessarily expect the AI system to be perfect. And I think we have to be, our expectations have to be managed in, in that sense. Um, obviously, the idea is that the AI system is as accurate as it can be, and hopefully it is more accurate than human decision making, but it's probably not going to be perfect because it's impossible to make sure that the data that it collects and uses is statistically perfect. It is impossible to know that the way it analyzes the data and that process is perfect. And so it's probably impossible to have an output that is going to be perfect. Um, and we have to then weigh up the improvements that we get through using AI, which could be a quicker process, hopefully a more accurate process, with the costs and there will inevitably be some costs. And I think the costs, particularly in the example you mentioned, will come from mistakes being made by the AI system. 
There was an interesting interview done with Uber following their accident. And they said, well, people are killed every day on the streets by human drivers. We have done thousands of tests and one person has died. And obviously they had to be very diplomatic about how they phrased this. But they said there are going to be costs to the use of AI. What we have to decide is whether those, the benefits of the AI are worth the few costs. And I think it comes down to your um, point about who is responsible. Maybe nobody should be responsible in the situation that you mentioned. I mean, if it's obvious that there is something wrong with the technology, such that the developer should have amended the software in a particular way, the people training the system did something wrong, then I would say responsibility should be left to them. But if you're happy that the AI system is working accurately, you've done comprehensive testing on it, and it makes a mistake, then there's probably an argument to say, it's made a mistake. Maybe no one should be responsible for that, and that's just one of the costs we have to accept. صباح الخير اولا شكرا لكم جزيلا على هذه المداخله القيمه اقدم نفسي السيده قرف يمينا رئيسه غرفه اتهام مجلس قضاء الجزائر بعد ما تفضلتم به من معلومات قيمه اود ان استفسر عن شيء ما يسمى بمساوئ مساوئ الذكاء الاصطناعي هل حسب رايكم هذه المساوئ قد نقللها كلما تحكمنا في مجال البيانات سؤالي الثاني نسمع حاليا عن ما يسمى بعدالة عدالة الذكاء الاصطناعي وقد تم هذا وقد تم الاعلان عنه في اعلانه في الفيسبوك عن طريق أداة لتحديد الانحيازات في مجال البيانات يسمى بتدفق العدالة فيرنس فلو هل لديكم توضيحات إضافية في هذا الموضوع وأشكركم Thank you. I, I think the, the first question was about reducing the disadvantages or lowering the, the costs um, in terms of the disadvantages of AI based on the data that's being used. And of course, data is intrinsic to AI. AI only works because it has lots of data to use. Um, and so data is the most important or one of the most important aspects of the AI system. And it's also one of the areas where things can go wrong. Um, if the data itself is impaired in some way, let's say you are using uh, an AI recruitment tool to assess candidates' application forms. Now, if the data that you're using to train the system and the data that you're giving to the system to decide on whether those applicants should be entitled to a job is flawed in some way, then the entire AI system will be flawed. So for example, if there is any bias in the data, maybe you have got too much data from one particular um, gender or one particular ethnic um, minority in the data, that will skew the entire data set. So in answer to your first question, Yes, the, the data is absolutely vital, um, and the better the quality of the data, the better the AI system will perform. And as humans, we are in control, or we are in more control of the data, because that's the part where the humans can have most influence on the AI system. As we said, AI models operate often in a black box environment, so we don't know how the AI system is using the data how it's analyzing it, what weight it's giving to certain features of the data. So that bit, humans have less control over, but we do have much more control over the data that we give to the AI system. Uh, and so that's the bit that as humans, we need to ensure that we get right. Uh, and that means trying to get the data as statistically um, diverse um, as possible. It means removing any bias that we can see in the data. Um, so I think in answer to your first question, yes, data is one of the biggest ways in which we can improve the accuracy of AI systems. I didn't quite catch your second question. I think it was whether there was 
potential prejudice in, in the use of, of AI, particularly in the Facebook examples you mentioned. Um, and that's something I'm going to come on to talk about this afternoon, um, the possibility of AI systems um, causing biased decisions or prejudicial decisions or decisions which discriminate against people. Uh, and, and that's one of the biggest issues in the AI world today is how you ensure that your AI system is treating everyone equally. And again, that comes down to the data that you use, because if the data is wrong, it, if it is imbalanced in some way, then that will force the AI system to make a decision based on that biased data. The AI system can only use the data it's been given. So if there's something wrong with that, then that can certainly lead to the risk of prejudice in the decision making of the AI system. I think that was your second question, but, but please do let me know if, uh, if I can help more with that. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Asmi Adil Ali Sumiti, Mil Qiyad Al Amal Shirta Dubai, Majlis Al Qada Shirti. Shukran Lestad Mish Al 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 Malumat Al Taiba, Li Stefana Fia Hakiratan, U Tahdidan Al Halat Al Halat Stahdam, Tabiqat Al Dakal Stanai. الدول المختلفة الخمس الأمثلة اللي ذكرها أنا حقيقة كنت أتمنى أن من المحاضر يستفيد شوي زيادة في مسألة الأمثلة هاي لفائدتها وأتمنى من المحاضرين الثانيين كذلك التركيز على الأمثلة ما فيها من الفائدة بحكم هو أستاذ مايش خبرتنا بح يعني بحكم عملك أنك استخدمت يعني في تطبيقات الذكاء الاصطناعي فأتمنى إذا كانت عندك قضية اشتغلت فيها أنت كشخص يعني في مجا في أمام المحاكم وتم استخدام تطبيق من تطبيقات ذكاء الاصطناعي أنك تعطينا فكرة عنها أو تتكلم عن إحدى القضايا اللي كان كان يعني تطبيق الذكاء الاصطناعي أحد أطراف القضية فيها بشكل ويفضل من القضايا اللي أنت يعني شهدتها شخصيا شكرا Thank you. Um, I'm certainly happy to provide more information about some of the examples that we looked at in the presentation. Um, so ple please feel free to come and speak to me and we can discuss those further. I, I would be happy to do that. Um, there is one interesting case in the English courts at the moment. And I, I should say there aren't that many legal cases involving AI yet. We looked yesterday at the example of the Uber driverless car hitting a, a woman, and I understand proceedings are still ongoing in that case. So there aren't that many examples of completed cases in judicial proceedings involving AI because it's still a relatively new concept. But there is one case going through the English courts at the moment which is um, very interesting and will potentially give some insight into how the English courts look at AI and how responsibility should be attributed when AI goes wrong. And the case involves um, a trading platform, so um, an, an asset manager or an investment fund that was using um, a platform which was powered by artificial intelligence, machine learning specifically, and it would make financial trades on the stock markets on its own. Um, and the way it did this was to analyze um, emotions in the financial markets by reviewing social media, by reviewing financial data, and it would work out what the trends were in the financial markets based on its own analysis with no human oversight into that analysis. And then it would tell a trading platform to invest in certain shares and stocks based on its own analysis. Now, unsurprisingly perhaps, uh, on one particular day, um, it invested in shares and made a huge loss for the investor. I think it was something like $20 million were lost on one day. And so the investor is now suing the investment manager, the, the people who are in control of the AI-powered platform, and it is saying things like, you should have had more understanding of how the AI system is working. You should have perhaps had more control over how it was working. And ultimately, it shouldn't have made me any losses. So that case raises an interesting question about 
who is liable, who is responsible when a piece of AI software goes wrong. And in this case, we will see what the courts say. They may, well, they may well say, this is an AI system. It might make mistakes. You can't hold the humans involved in the process responsible. You must have realized that the AI system acts autonomously, makes its own decisions, and that's the risk you took as an investor. And you have to accept that sometimes the AI might get trading decisions wrong in the same way as a human might get trading decisions wrong. Or the English courts might say, I agree, the investment manager should have understood better how the AI system was working. Maybe there was a problem in the system itself. Maybe the data it was using had an issue in some way, in which case maybe the courts will feel more comfortable holding the humans involved responsible for the issues. So that is a case that is ongoing in the English courts. We are following it very closely. And when we have a decision from the court, which we'll hopefully have next year after the, the case goes to trial, it will be very interesting to see how that plays out. Sabah Saeed, Mudir Ham Al Mahal Kabai bin Mamlaka Magribia. لدي سؤال أو سؤالين ينصبفاني في نفس السياق من الأسئلة التي تفضل بها الزملاء فقط أود أن أسأل بخصوص مدخلتكم القيمة استمعت إلى أن القاضي يستمع إلى الذكاء الاصطناعي أو لا يستمع إلى هذه التقنية ف أود معرفة ما المقصود بتقنية الذكاء الاصطناعي في الاستعمال يعني القانوني أو القضائي فإذا كان المقصود استخدام التقنيات التكنولوجية لربح الوقت والحصول على بيانات حصول على تحليل لمعطيات فيمكن أن أدخلها في زمرة الخبرات التقنية التي يأمر بها القضاة عادة أما إذا كان المقصود باستعمال هذه التقنية بوسائل وآلات وحواسب لتسهيل ممورية القاضي أو بالأحرى أن تحل محل عقل القاضي فهذا مجال آخر أنا بالنسبة لي هذا الخيط الرفيع ما بين الخبرات التقنية وأن تحل مح هذه التقنية الذكاء الاصطناعي محل عقل القاضي فهنا يوجد الخلاف لأن نعلم أن القانون الذي يستعمل من طرف القاضي أو يطبق من طرف القاضي هو علم متحول يعني يتغير غير ثابت فكما جاء في مداخلات الزميل المداخلة الأولى في البحث الجنائي في الجرائم بصفة عامة أو جرائم الإرهاب نعتمد عادة على التجربة والممارسة المرتبطة بتقنيات البحث الجنائي بالنسبة للقاضي الجنائي فهناك سلطة تقديرية هناك سلطة ترجيح هل ممكن هذه التقنية اللي هي تقنية الذكاء الاصطناعي أن تقوم بمثل هذه الأشياء وتكون في نفس الوقت سهلت مامورية القاضي ولكن حلت محله في تصريف وتحليل هذه الملفات شكرا thank you there, there were a, a number of interesting points made there i think that the short answer is that one day we we could see artificial intelligence replacing judges and that could be the case where and yesterday we spoke about the differences in AI technology. Currently, we have what's called weak or narrow artificial intelligence, which can perform one job, but it can do that job very well. But it still doesn't yet have the qualities that humans do. And that's something that we'll see more in the next generation of artificial intelligence, which we call general artificial intelligence, where machines start to think more like humans. And so that takes me on to the point about whether AI will ever be good enough to replace judges. Because as you quite rightly said, judges rely on their experience 
uh, and they rely on, on, on the human orientated understanding of a particular case. So I, I gave the example in this presentation about uh, a, a scenario where a homeless person steals some food in order that they can survive. Now, we could have an artificial intelligence system which one day recognizes that a homeless person perhaps deserves more sympathy, and, and we as humans have some sympathy towards that person. But that is a very human-centric emotion, and I would question whether AI is ever able to understand that level of emotion. And, and that's the type of analysis that a, a human judge would be able to bring to the decision-making process. They would be able to really see this through the eyes of a human being, um, which is, of course, very important for judges because they interpret and apply society's standards. So what we consider fair as a society, a judge will be able to understand that. And so my biggest concern about AI being used to replace judges is whether or not the machine would have that level of human cognitive understanding to be able to make those difficult decisions in situations like that. But as I said earlier in the presentation, that is not to say that artificial intelligence can and should not help judges in their everyday roles. So for example, the system being used in Pakistan and China currently looks at how previous cases have been decided in similar facts. That's just AI helping the judge understand other decisions made in the past. That's giving the judge vital information which he or she might not otherwise be able to get. And so that's where I see, certainly for the time being, AI playing a big role in judicial decision making, providing more information, providing that information quicker, and allowing judges therefore to make a more reliable decision, but one which is still based fundamentally on their own analysis and their own decision. صباح الخير انا طارق صالح قاضي مصري معار في دائره الشؤون القانونيه لحكومه دبي طبعا انا بنضم لجميع ما, ما تفضل الزملاء بذكره من وجوب اعمال الذكاء الاصطناعي كوسيله مساعده للقضاء وليس الحلول محل القضاء او استبدالهم سيما ان احنا كقضاء بنقوم باجراءات بدءا من مرحلة النيابة العامة ثم التحول إلى منصة القضاء تنطوي على الاستماع إلى الشهود وكان في دراسة حديثة قريبة توصلت إلى أن 57% من ثقة القاضي بتصل إليه من تعبيرات وجه الشاهد أو المجني عليه و 35% من نبرة الصوت و 8% فقط من الأقوال اللي بدل بيها ومن ثم فلا بد من العامل البشري لأنه عامل مهم وأرجو أن حضرتك تتفضل بإلقاء الضوء على السلبيات الخاصة أو بعض المسالب بالذكاء الاصطناعي وأهمها هو ارتفاع نسبة البطالة وفقدان الوظائف تمام وما يتصل بسرية المدولة وخصوصية المدولة والتي لن نستطيع الوصول إليها من خلال الذكاء الاصطناعي وشكرا Thank you. That was um, very interesting to hear those statistics from the, the study in, in Egypt, um, which I'll look at in more detail. Um, because as you say, the human elements that judges provide is very important in judicial decision making. And, and, and those statistics really do highlight that point. Um, in terms of the downsides of artificial intelligence, you, you mentioned the loss of jobs. I, I think that's certainly uh, a concern for people generally about automation, um, using computers and machines more and more in society, um, particularly artificial intelligence. Um, I think, and there have been a few studies done on this, but perhaps ultimately there won't be um, as much reduction to employment as people fear because new jobs are created in the AI industry um, and by the AI industry. So we hope that actually AI will result in a transfer of skills and a transfer of employment between industries rather than a net loss um, in employment. But I absolutely agree, whenever there is going to be 
a, a risk to employment that the that the concerns need to be looked at. We need to properly protect workers who are subject to potentially losing their employment due to AI. And we also need to make sure that opportunities are offered um, for those people to make sure that they are not out of work as a result of AI. So I fully understand that concern, um, but I think ultimately I have faith in, in governments uh, and, and national institutions, particularly where we collaborate in conferences like this, to find solutions to problems like the loss of empl employment. The second point you mentioned was confidentiality. Um, and I think that's a, an important point, um, particularly when it comes to judicial processes. And again, it comes back to the point I, I mentioned earlier about the fact that when we introduce and develop AI technologies, we need to do so in a way where we have trust in those technologies. So we have a piece of technology, we take a long time to properly assess it, to properly test it, to make sure that we have trust in its use so that when it is finally deployed in real life situations, we are happy that it is operating as it should be. And confidentiality is one of those parameters that we would hope in the development of and testing of the AI technology is something that we ensure um, is protected. Having said that, because it is uh, a piece of software, it is digital, it is probably connected digitally to the rest of the world, there is obviously a greater risk for cybercrime, for breach of confidentiality, for all of the um, protection that people will create for AI systems and computer software in general. There will always be someone in the world who is able to break down those barriers uh, and commit crime, potentially breaching that confidentiality. So I think that's a very important point, um, but I think it goes hand in hand with making sure that the AI technology we develop is trustworthy, um, and that it does what we want it to do, and it does that well. And until we are happy we get to that point, we should all be very cautious about using AI technology. مرة أخرى وأسمح لنفسي أن أتكلم مرتين نظرا لأهمية ما تفضلتم به ونظرا للقيمة العالية التي التي يستخلصون من هذا العرض القيم فعلا سؤال آخر دائما السيدة قلت يمينا من الجزائر رئيسة غرفة اتهام أعتقد أنه هناك مثال يتداول في في جوجل وما يتعلق بمساوئ استخدام الذكاء الاصطناعي وهو مقتل هناك مثال معروف ومقتل أحد المشات في ولاية أريزونا الأمريكية بواسطة سيارة ذاتية القيادة تحت التجربة التابعة لشركة أوبر هناك مخاطر أخرى استنتجتها شركة فيسبوك جوجل من خلال المعطيات الغير حقيقية التي قد نطلق عن طريق بيانات تؤدي إلى الإضرار بأشخاص آخرين سواء في مجالنا القاضي أو في مجال آخر هل ألا ترون من فضلكم أن تقنين, تقنين استعمال الذكاء الاصطناعي حان أوانه؟ وهل لديكم أمثلة لدول اتبعت هذا المسار أي تقنين مجال استخدام الذكاء الاصطناعي والضوابط التي تحكم هذا الاستخدام حتى يبقى استعماله في حدود ضيقة تحقق العدالة لا تضرب الآخرين ويكون في المصلحة وليس من أجل أضرار أو مخاطر أخرى وشكرا لكم Uh, thank you. That was um, yeah, a, a very important question I, I think you raised. And so the driverless car example um, was something w we discussed yesterday. And, and obviously, issues like that are going to generate public concern in, in artificial intelligence. Um, the Facebook example uh, is also an interesting one. I think that the situation you might be thinking of is um, Facebook using adverts on the Facebook platform which discriminate against um, females from um, a jobs perspective. It's something I will t talk about later on. But the important point you mentioned is whether regulation exists, uh, and if not, should regulation exist in order to ensure that AI decision making is um, regulated in some way, it's as accurate as possible, and that we hold people to account when AI goes wrong. 
I mean, looking at the world today, I think it is fair to say that there isn't yet very much regulation um, governing AI. There is some regulation around the world, for example, in, in the UK, in Singapore, soon to be introduced in California, which re regulates the use of AI when personal data is involved. And the piece of legislation called the GDPR, which I'm sure you've all heard of in Europe, has an obligation on individuals and companies to ensure that whenever they are using personal data in an automated context, including artificial intelligence, that they are able to explain how that personal data is being used. And it will be a breach of that regulation if they are unable to explain how the AI is being used. And this concept of explainability and trustworthiness is the focal point of regulations such as the GDPR, and also in many ethical principles around the world. So the OECD has a set of principles which emphasize that the use of AI must be fair and transparent and explainable. So I think we haven't yet got to the situation where there is widespread regulation governing who is responsible when AI goes wrong. At the moment, the onus seems to be on the people and the companies developing the AI technology and using the AI technology to make sure that their use of it is transparent and explainable. Because the first step is to build trust in AI systems. But I think in due course, we will see regulation appearing that makes certain people liable or which compensates victims when AI goes wrong. I mentioned yesterday in the UK, we have a piece of legislation which extends compulsory insurance in the vehicle industry to automated vehicles. So if you crash your automated vehicle or the vehicle crashes, then insurance will be available to compensate victims. And that sort of regulation, I think we will see more and more of in the future. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. أنا معاكم أخوكم المستشار عويد التويمر مدير عام معهد الكويت للدراسات القضائية والقانونية بداية نشكر السيد ثاني وكافة الزملاء على ما استعرضوا لنا خلال اليومين الماضيين من عرض لإنجازات وتطلعات في الذكاء الاصطناعي وكان هذا العرض شيق جدا ووافي إنما يعني استوقفني موضوع كنا نعيش من الأمس واليوم بثورة صناعية متمثلة في الحوسبة الرقمية والتكنولوجيا ثلاثية الأبعاد والثورة الحاصلة أيضا في مجال التواصل الاجتماعي والعالم الرقمي كل هذه الثورات قد وضعت لها قوانين وتم تطبيقها في المحاكم إحنا يمكن اليوم وفي المستقبل راح نبدأ بثورة جديدة متمثلة في الإنسان الآلي وهو الروبوت وتحدثتم بالأمس واليوم عن عدة أمثلة حول هذا الموضوع وتطبيقاته في القضاء وخصوصا في المملكة المتحدة السؤال اللي, 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 اللي يعني أحب أني أستمع إلى إجابته هل هناك قانون في المملكة المتحدة ينظم عملية استخدام الإنسان الآلي أو الروبوت؟ لأننا يعني تواجهنا مشكلة في القضاء دائما أن هناك قاعدة تقول بأن الأدلة التي لم يحددها القانون هي والعدم سواء فهل هناك قوانين وإذا كان هناك قوانين أو ليست هناك قوانين لماذا لم يقم الخبراء الفنيين أمثالكم بوضع قانون استرشادي ممكن للدول جميعها أن تقوم بتطبيقه أو العمل على تعديلات وفق احتياجات كل دولة شكرا Thank you for your kind comments to start with um, I think two, two points that I think it would be helpful to discuss uh, arising from your, your helpful explanation the first is how we see the evolution of laws and regulations when it comes to new technologies. Uh, and I think what we're seeing in artificial intelligence is quite common when we look at the new, uh, new technologies and how they are regulated. So at the start of the process, we will see lots of guidance uh, and non-binding 
um, guidance or guidelines about the use of new technology. There will be a lot of ethical guidance, as there is in AI. There will be a lot of consultation um, within jurisdictions and across jurisdictions about what is the best way to approach regulation. Because in order to have sufficient and adequate regulation, we first need to understand the technology. And I think when it comes to AI, we are still in the process of fully understanding what AI is, um, how it is used, and making difficult decisions about who should be responsible when it goes wrong. So I think that's the discussion that's happening at the moment, and I think in the next few years, we will see those discussions, that ethical guidance, transform to specific regulation governing AI. Um, the second point I, I want to address um, is, is just in terms of what regulation there is already to govern the use of AI. And I spoke about yesterday, you have two broad options. You can try and use your existing regulation to cover AI. And an interesting example of that would be in product liability, which is uh, a liability regime that exists in Europe. And it is a form of strict liability, which means if there is a defect in a particular product, then the developer of the product is automatically liable um, even if they are not at fault. And, and the point of that regime is to encourage high standards when it comes to the development of products. Now, if it is the case that AI can be considered to be a product in some way, or if the product is manufactured using robotic processes, then there is already some regulation that can deal with a situation where the robotic process goes wrong, or the AI itself, if it can be considered a product, goes wrong. The question is whether that regulation is good enough to cover AI. Um, and, and so one of the questions we will also be looking at in the next few years is how existing regulation can apply to AI. And if it can't, what new regulation we should introduce um, to cover um, AI specifically. So for example, the compulsory insurance law that I mentioned in, in the UK. Okay, you have time. Uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen, I, I think we've run out of time, but um, I will be here all day and, and obviously available, so happy to take any further questions um, outside of this. Thank you very much.